And these are some of the famous, <clears throat> excuse me, H blocks. Four located here, and two located there, and two more located here. And here we have the interesting left arrow sign. It is unique at this location. So there are nine H blocks in total. It's quite possible that there may have been a few more, but unlikely many more, because the H block is a weird shape. And the construction of the little town of Tiwanaku over here, which is partially composed of stone from Pumapunku and Tiwanaku. We don't see any evidence of H blocks there. So the idea that it was some kind of ramp for <clears throat> a rocket ship or that um, it was a giant wall is highly unlikely. But if there were only nine H blocks, what was the function? Now, where is this? We are now in the highlands of Peru, outside of Cusco, at a location called Tipong, which is a magnificent agricultural terracing system that still functions to this day. It was likely built 700 plus years ago and is located about a one hour drive south of the city of Cusco. It's absolutely massive in scale, and all of this is Inca construction, but if you go a little off to the left, let's say one kilometer in the background, then you reach an area which is older than the Inca and is megalithic. I know people who've gone there, but I personally have not yet. So Tipong is not visited by that many people. Probably 1% of the people who go to Machu Picchu will go to Tipong. But if you're going to be spending time in and around Cusco, it's well worth a visit and is included in the general tourist ticket card that you will purchase. Next, we are at what is called Little Kenko. That is Cusco in the background. So just to the north of Cusco and close to the more famous Sacsayhuaman is the megalithic site called Little Kenko. Some of these stones weigh upwards of at least 100 tons. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration. Let's be conservative and say 40 tons. It's, uh, it's located actually exactly in between the more famous sites of Sacsayhuaman and Kenko proper. Again, well worth a visit if you happen to be in the Cusco area. And here we are at another Inca site close to Little Kenko. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that the cross blocks at the top of the depressions there are of a different type of stone. So the main function of this video is to show you the obvious difference between Inca period construction and pre-Inca. The pre-Inca is finer and is the megalithic. It's going to obviously show us that the Inca found this site called Machu Picchu, which means ancient mountain, and then they built around a megalithic core. Uh, there's a the common story that you'll hear from archaeologists and from guides here is the finer work is the imperial Inca work, as in for the, for the high-ranking people. But why do we find um, superior construction lower and inferior higher? Or where do we find prof why do we find profound construction in one spot and right next to it we find inferior? That doesn't make sense whatsoever. Okay, good. Now 
Now the reason I'm saying Inca repair is because I ask the people who work here and the officials what has been restored and what has not been restored in modern times. And it's only the ones that have not been restored in modern times and are from the Inca time period that I'm looking at in terms of saying upper part crude Inca, lower part more profound pre-Inca. Who were they? Maybe they were called the Pirwas. That's where Peru gets its name. We honestly don't know. But we do know that the Inca recognized that there were technologically more profound people than them who had been here in the very distant past. We're at the ancient megalithic site of Ollante Tambo, and here you will see two styles of construction. One being Inca, which is the more recent, and the other is the megalithic, because the Inca found the site of Ollante Tambo, and then they built their constructions. What you'll definitely see is that the oldest construction is far superior to that of the Inca made by an unknown ancient civilization. Our guide today is local wisdom keeper Wilco Apasa from Cusco. I explained uh, in the spiritual uh, explain, no? Here. Yeah, the question is um, these big stones, the it's possible the Incas doing, mm -hmm. or the other ancient, ancient, uh, ancient civilization, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I perceive more uh, pride to the with what machines is possible to cut these rocks, no? Right. Yeah. So here we have a problem. If you could move that stone all the way from the quarry, why wouldn't you make this one fit with that one? Why would you fill in rubble like that? So here at Oyente Tambo, you saw two very obvious styles of construction. And for those who have seen my videos before, I don't even have to tell you but the inferior work was done by the famous and brilliant Inca culture, but the megalithic work was something they found in place when they discovered this site approximately 1,000 years ago. So the history of Peru is far older, far more complex, and far more fascinating than most people realize. And the same is true, of course, of Egypt. Before the dynastic Egyptians. There were the great builders who created the Giza pyramids as well as other structures. And now it's time for us to just wake up to that fact that many academics have uh, taught us history wrong and that history has to be rewritten by those of us who are interested in the subject. Now, some people think that that acoustic thing that we do is corny and it's new age and whatever. It's not. What it is doing, it is showing you that these recesses are tuned to a specific sound. Likely the sound ohm, and the vibration of the planet itself is several octaves below that. So, now the first obvious thing you can see are the eyes 
the nose, and the mouth area. The mouth is incredibly tiny, and the eyes appear to be quite large. The most astonishing aspect of it, of course, is that if it died at childbirth or three months old, that it is at least twice the size of a normal Homo sapiens sapiens. Its shape and size are not the result of water on the brain. What you can also make out is this is the neck. This is where the spinal cord and vertebrae enter the skull, and you can see that it's way in the back. In a normal human, it's in the center. So that's a very curious point. Again, the eye is here, nose is there, tiny mouth somewhere here, and look at the overall shape of it. It's absolutely massive for a newborn to three month old. Of course, another obvious characteristic is you see the hair. The hair is not black like Native Americans. The hair is a dark red, which is typical of the ancient Paracas culture of 2,000 plus years ago. They were naturally red-headed, which also could have meant that they had very light skin, because light skin and red hair go hand in hand. And then on the other side of the skull, again, here's the eye, the left eye, a very tiny nose, very small mouth. It would be an excellent candidate for DNA testing, if that is possible. Again, the owner is someone who does not want his name listed, and as strange as it sound, or sounds, pre-Columbian artifacts on the coast of Peru in this area south of Lima are very common. Many people have them in their houses, and in general, the government of Peru does not seem to mind that. What they do not accept is the exportation of ancient pre-Columbian artifacts. And so do not even bother trying to inquire whether this piece is for sale or not because it is heavily prohibited to export pre-Columbian artifacts of any kind, including obviously a human skull, out of the nation, the Republic of Peru. So the Inca found this place about the year 1400. They did not carve the whole thing. They made constructions here, but what they discovered was that this entire mountaintop had been carved probably thousands of years prior to their existence. The Inca aspect is here. That wall you see is Inca construction. These walls here are Inca construction. But the carving itself, just based on the weathering alone, tells us that it's much, much older. So it was a very common thing or theme of the Inca to find an ancient site like this that predated them probably, probably by thousands of years and then adopt the site and build a ceremonial center around it or in the vicinity. This is what we see at such places as Machu Picchu because the core of Machu Picchu is megalithic and also Oriente Tambo Sacsayhuaman, Kenko, etc. So the Inca clearly revered whoever these ancient megalithic builders or people were and decided to build their own structures nearby. And often a wall would embrace an older structure. Again, very common, commonly seen in the city and around the city of Cusco in Peru. So here we have the baby or the fetus. As you can see, its skull is the size of its torso. This is not hydrocephaly. This, and we'll discuss this with the doctor, seems to be some kind of genetic anomaly. And now here we have the tanny so-called Tani skeleton. According to radiologist Ken, this was a young woman who died between 8 and 12 years old. And, but we do have Dr. Dave here. And doctor, can you give us some 
insights into what you're looking at? Well, it looks to me like he does have the, uh, the coronal sutures on both sides. I think he does have a, a, a sagittal suture here has been pushed back, but he doesn't have an etopic suture. That's what he's missing uh -huh. in the frontal area. And is that an irregularity? It can be. We see it from time to time in, in, in regular humans. And how about the shape of the skull? Do you think this is the result of head binding? I can't, uh, I can't say for sure. Um, it, it looks like it is. See the sagittal suture up there. You've got your camera on it now, uh -huh. and behind that are the um, lambdoid sutures. So, Dr. Dave, you are a neurologist, Correct. and what uh, observations uh, have you made as regards the two specimens that you just saw? Well, the most one that's fascinating to me is the infant, the child. I mean. This baby was born with an elongated skull, obviously. It is obviously not the product of obstructive hydrocephalus. The morphology of the shape of the skull is not consistent with that diagnosis. So clearly this baby was born that way, which makes it very interesting indeed. And here we are on a different continent. This is the famous site of Petra in Jordan. Okay, we're at the beginnings of what's called the Sikh, which is the entryway to the famous aspects of Petra in Jordan. And already we've been seeing tool marks similar to what we see at Baalbek in Lebanon and also on the Giza Plateau. Susan, our geologist, has stated that the stone in this area so far is likely about seven on the Mohs scale out of ten. And in order to do that, to work this stone, you require very hard iron or steel tools. And we're talking, they're talking conventionally that all this work was done 2,000 years ago. But where would they have gotten so many steel tools in order to do this work? Now, the seek itself is not a short little tunnel. It's a mile and a half long. That's right, you have to walk a mile and a half from the entrance to get to the famous structure called the Treasury, which was made famous in one of the Indiana Jones films. Most tourists simply will walk down the Seek and visit the Treasury and then turn around and go back without understanding that Petra goes on for another five and a half miles. It took us all day to walk from one end to the back end and then back to the entrance again. It's a phenomenal place to visit. Highly, highly recommend it if you're anywhere near Jordan. So here we are approaching the famous part of it called the Seek, which is finally finished and has been reconstructed. But again, it's only 1% or less than 1% of the site called Petra. There's also another ancient site called Little Petra, half an hour. It appears to me that the initial work is actually quite simple in terms of form, like, like that in behind, where you have flat surfaces, you have the caves or the chambers, you have this domed area, and sometimes this curve. And then after that came the Nabataeans, who hired artisans to do the surface work, especially at the, uh, the treasury, because the treasury is right at the opening of the seek, so that's why they wanted it to look spectacular. I guess they didn't have the finances to be able to get all of the rest of this done in detailed ornamentation, which you will see momentarily. Now this structure is very similar in construction to the famous treasury, though not as ornately carved. 
it is located five and a half miles walk from the treasury itself. So again, you see how huge Petra is. Among other things, Petra is astonishing because of its sheer scale. The idea that a tribal nomadic people started this from scratch and built the whole thing in the course of two or three hundred years is completely ridiculous. But what's also amazing is we see many examples of ancient megalithic work in Peru and especially in Egypt where acoustics were vital, a vital aspect of the whole construction. And so what you're going to hear inside this massive chamber will probably, hopefully, blow your mind. So, tuned to Ohm, just like the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid. Oh! Done on purpose. And these are the original tool marks. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our little tour here of Petra. We basically covered most of the site. There's still more seemingly up here. But if you'd like to join us, then please do. Um, and you can follow me through my YouTube channel or also my mega uh, website called hiddenincatours.com. Enjoy.